Let's move to the last talk of this session. And Sujita is going to tell us about our call separation between QMA and QCMA. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, okay, uh, this is based on joint work with uh, my supervisor, Shalav Pandivar. And okay, yeah. So I'll start off by um, explaining what QMA and QCMA are. Uh, so both of these are complexity classes that are quantum generalizations of NP. So how do you make a quantum generalization of NP? It, uh, this is um, done in uh, MA in terms of um, uh, an interactive game between a polynomial time uh, verifier Arthur and uh, a mysterious wizard Molin with like unbounded computational power. So um, Arthur has some input uh, Z that Arthur wants to know if it's a yes instance of a particular um, say promise problem. And Merlin um, knows Z and Merlin wants to convince Arthur that it is a yes instance. Um, and the condition that's required is that if uh, Z is a yes instance, then there should exist a witness uh, that can convince Arthur with high probability um, that Z is a yes instance um, that uh, Merlin would send to Arthur. And if it's a no instance, then um, no witness that Merlin could possibly send uh, will convince uh, Arthur. And um, how do you make this quantum? So the, there are two approaches. In QCMA, what you do is um, you make uh, Arthur quantum. So Arthur is now a BQB machine. But uh, the witness that um, Merlin sends to Arthur is still classical. It's a classical string. Um, and the condition on the witness is similar. And in QMA, instead, the um, Arthur and the witness are both uh, quantum. So Arthur is a BQB machine, and Merlin sends a, a quantum witness to Arthur. Um, now, so I've defined uh, these two classes. So whether or not they're equal is one of the big open questions of uh, quantum complexity theory. So first of all, it's um, easy to see that QCMA is contained in QMA because um, a QCMA witness can just be encoded as a, encoded as a computational base, basis state. Um, so the main direction of the question is whether QMA is contained in QCMA. So uh, this question is kind of asking when Arthur is already uh, a BQB machine, do quantum witnesses actually provide any advantage over classical witnesses? Um, so the, whether or not QMA is contained in QCMA was the question was uh, first posed by Aharonov and Nave in 2004. And they actually conjectured um, that no, uh, uh, as in uh, quantum uh, witnesses do not provide any advantage. So QMA is um, contained in QCMA. Um, I don't know if they've changed their mind on it after, since then. It's been like 20 years. Um, what uh, this would look like for a specific problem is, um, OK, um, so we can consider a QMA complete problem. The canonical QMA complete problem is um, uh, the K-local Hamiltonian. And um, the QMA witness for that problem is uh, the ground state of, a K of the K-local Hamiltonian that is given to you. And maybe it's possible that um, for every K-local Hamiltonian, there is an efficient circuit that prepares, prepares its ground state. And in that case, um, you can just uh, give a description of the um, efficient circuit as a classical witness. And this would um, constitute a QCMA proof um, for that QMA complete problem, um, in which case QMA would in fact be equal to QCMA. Um, but OK, we are, you know, I'm just talking about these complexity classes as is, and it's completely beyond our current techniques to solve uh, this question in the plane model. Um, but given that we have this question, uh, the first thing a complexity theorist would do is uh, try to separate the classes with uh, respect to an oracle. So if you can se separate QMA and QCMA with respect to an oracle, that means um, a relativizing proof technique, so which means a proof technique that works um, fine if you introduce an oracle. Um, the a relativizing proof technique cannot prove that QMA is equal to QCMA. Um, so usually when we talk about an oracle separation, the oracle is classical, which means it's a long classical string that uh, um, which can be an arbitrarily complicated function that uh, a BQ, the BQP algorithm in QCMA can um, query with like unit cost. Um, but the thing is, techniques that relativize with respect to um, classical oracles also relativize with respect to quantum oracles. By a quantum oracle, I mean a uh, uh, black box unitary um, for uh, a sequence of black box unitary, uh, unitaries un for every n. And the quantum al algorithm can apply this um, also um, uh, 
for cost one. Um, and um, actually, quantum oracle separations between QMA and QCMA are relatively easy. And they have been known for a while. The first one was shown by Aronson and Cooperberg in 2007. And subsequent uh, quantum oracle separations have been shown, for example, by Pfefferman and Kimmel, and then um, Basilian, Pfefferman, and Marhawa. Um, they're still quantum, but maybe a bit less quantum than the separation shown by um, Aronson and Cooperberg. Um, so, but as I said, the standard model of oracle separations is um, a, a classical oracle. And kind of, if you show a separation with respect to a classical oracle, that's like you're showing a separation for like a classical problem rather than a quantum problem. So you're um, trying to answer the question of whether quantum um, um, witnesses provide any advantage uh, for a classical problem, uh, which is like maybe stronger. And um, so people have been uh, trying to show a full classical oracle separation and there has been some progress recently uh, in the last couple of years. So um, the first result was by uh, Natarajan and Nirke um, last year. So they showed a separation between QMA and QCMA in a distributional oracle setting. So this means that uh, the oracle is classical but and it comes from a distribution. Um, Merlin doesn't know the exact oracle but Merlin knows the distribution and Merlin can send a witness based on the distribution. Um, and uh, after that, there was another um, result by uh, Lee, Liu, Pelekarnos, and Yamakawa. Uh, they showed a separation between QM and QCMA with respect to a class classically accessible classical oracle. So um, by classically accessible, I mean the, you know, the oracle is classical, but in general, a quantum oracle, a quantum algorithm should be able to query the oracle in superposition. Um, but in this result, they uh, placed a restriction that the quantum oracle cannot, uh, sorry, the classical oracle cannot be queried in superposition. And um, in the setting of oracles, uh, you know, um, in query complexity, this means this, this class is kind of essentially MA. And yeah, their separation was in query complexity was uh, between QMA and MA in that case. Um, so um, now I come to our result. So our result, um, yeah, is in this long line of work of attempted classical oracle separations um, between QMA and QCMA. Um, and it's not strictly an improvement on the previous results, but um, we think like maybe it's um, intuitively closer to a full oracle separation, a full classical oracle separation. Um, so our main result is that there exists an oracle relative to which um, you can separate um, bounded round QMA and bounded round QCMA. So uh, the number of, uh, by bounded round, I mean um, the quantum and classical, uh, sorry, the quantum algorithms for QMA and QCMA can um, um, make um, R batches of parallel queries um, to um, the classical oracle, where R is um, smaller than log n by log log n. Um, so each batch can have polynomially many queries. So you still have polynomially many queries overall, but they cannot be arbitrarily adaptive. Um, so the oracle that we use for our construction is a simplified version of the construction of um, the construction by Liliu, Pelekano, and Yamakawa. And uh, it uses, makes use of the um, you know, famous yamakawa jandri problem, which uh, was used to show, uh, show a quantum advantage with respect to a random oracle. Um, we're not sure of the parameters of the yamakawa jandri problem, is good enough for um, a full oracle separation between um, QMA and QCMA. But we conjecture maybe a problem with um, good enough parameters exists, and this will lead to um, a full separation by our techniques. OK, um, so um, oracle separations are based essentially separations in query complexity. So I will um, now explain what the classes QMA and QCMA look like in query complexity. So in query complexity, um, you have a, uh, for uh, decision problems, you have a known partial Boolean function and uh, an unknown input that you want to compute the function on. Uh, so for query QCMA, it looks like this. You have um, Arthur and Merlin as before. Um, there is some um, uh, unknown input that uh, Arthur can query um, via an Oracle OZ for the input Z. And Arthur is um, a BQP machine, so Arthur can query the Oracle OZ in superposition. And uh, Merlin is computationally unbounded, so Merlin 
potentially could have queried the oracle oz in his uh, free time and merlin knows um z fully and merlin sends a classical proof depending on uh, z to arthur um and as before the uh, if z is a yes instance then um you know we have the usual conditions that arthur should not be uh, should be convinced um uh, by merlin if not then arthur should not be and the complexity measure in this case is the number of queries that um arthur needs to make to the oracle and plus the size of the witness that uh, merlin sends um in query qma everything is similar except the witness that merlin sends is a quantum state okay now i'll talk about the yamakawa jandri problem of it because that's um what we use to get our separation um so yamakawa and um jandri showed uh, this result there exists a family of relations um uh, r of f that are sequenced by uh, functions um from n cross 0 1 to the mn 2 0 1 um so first of all these relations can be solved by a uh, a uh, uh, quantum algorithm that makes um uh, a you uh, polynomially many queries to an oracle for f um and uh, yeah this uh, works with high probability for a uniformly uh, random but on the other hand um no algorithm that uh, no classical algorithm that makes polynomially many queries to the oracle for f can um solve the relation for uniformly random f by solve the relation i mean given um an input x um find a u such that x comma u is an oracle um and the relation specifically looks like this um you have a fixed linear code that has um, good list decodability parameters etc um and r of f looks like this so x the input x to the uh, relation is an n bit string and um given x you have to output a code word um u that is yeah it's in the code c such that um if you look at every m bit block of uh, the code code word um uh and call it ui so f of uh, i comma ui basically should evaluate to xi the i th bit of x uh, okay this is slightly complicated but uh this uh, relation has some nice properties so for example for those familiar with the complexity class tfnp it's sort of an tfnp so um by this i mean for like almost every fnx there exists some um u such that uh, x comma u is an r of f so i i say sort of because this is not exactly true for every f and x but it's true for uh, almost every f and that's fine for our purposes and also um for every x of u x comma u that is an r of f there is a short partial assignment um uh, certifying this fact so uh, specifically it's uh, this short partial assignment for every i f of uh, i comma ui is uh xi uh this is like an n bit partial assignment and this certifies that x comma u um, is an r of f just by definition of r of f um so after yamakawa and janri um, came up with the result after this uh, liu noticed that um the quantum algorithm for um, solving the yamakawa janri uh, problem does not um the queries of that algorithm don't actually depend on x and they're also not adaptive so what this means is that r of f can in fact be solved with no queries and a quantum advice state so uh, whatever the state the yamagawa janri algorithm was preparing by making queries uh, it can just be given as an advice state and uh, uh, there is a quantum algorithm that um, solves solves the yamagawa janri problem with this advice state and specifically the advice state looks like this it's a superposition over uh, all ui and um, with the function value f i comma ui um uh given and uh, you actually need a few copies of the state but yeah this is the basic form of the state and um also you you showed that um rff cannot be solved with classical advice so you, you can prove this like kind of similarly to how you showed that it cannot be solved by um uh, polynomially many classical queries um in light of this result uh, the construction by llpy can be seen kind of as a formula for converting um a quantum versus classical advice separation for um, a relation r of f to a query qma versus a qcma separation this recipe is not black box so it's not going to work for every um, classical versus quantum advice but 
um, it works for uh, problems that are uh, like Yamakawa uh, Yeah. Um, so the construction is like this. It's going to be um, based on um, this BPP problem, which, um, uh, yeah, this BPP problem, which is um, so give, distinguishing these uh, two oracles. So suppose you are given um, uh, an oracle, which is one in every position versus an oracle, um, which is one in very few positions and zeros in most positions. So distinguishing these um, two oracles is in BPP because you can just query a random position and depending on the answer you get, you answer that it is a yes instance or a no instance. So suppose the all one string is a yes instance and the not very many one string is a no instance. Now, um, the construction is just going to be like this problem, except we are going to blow up the, the Oracle by a lot. Um, so we have a relation R of F that separates classical versus quantum advice. Now, what we're going to do is um, we are going to consider an oracle where um, each position of the oracle is uh, labeled by um, uh, x comma u, where x comma u is a possible um, input output pair for uh, a hidden uh, for R of f for some hidden f. Um, so, and our um, yes instance for our problem is going to correspond to um, uh, x comma uh, u in R of F, those positions um, uh, being equal to one. And um, so that is our yes instance. So for the hidden F that we have, uh, every valid input output pair has a one. And the no instance oracle is going to be the yes instance oracle, except um, some of the XU pairs are erased, like most of them are erased. So um, the idea is that if you can find a valid um, XU pair, then um, you can query it and uh, try to see whether uh, it has a one or it doesn't have a one, and therefore you can distinguish between these two oracles. But uh, you'll notice that um, this doesn't actually work with um, any uh, relation R of F that separates classical versus quantum advice. Because um, if R of F is not sparse, if um, x, x comma u for like many possible u's belongs in the relation, then in the first case, you will have lots of ones in your Oracle. And in the second case, um, you will not have very many ones. So it kind of reduces to the BPP problem and therefore you can distinguish them. So you, uh, the R of F that separates classical versus quantum advice that you need uh, needs to be a sparse relation, which the Yamakawa Jandri problem um, satisfies. So this potentially works. Okay, um, so for distinguishing these two Oracles, first of all, I'll state what exactly is the QMA Oracle more formally. So our Oracle is going to be labeled by a hidden function uh, f and a subset of zero one to then. So O of uh, f comma i is going to be uh, at, at x comma u is going to be um, one if x, or x comma u is an R of f and x is not in uh, the set e where the set e is the set of erased um, locations basically. And it's going to be zero otherwise. And the problem is to distinguish um, between E being equal to the empty set, so no locations are erased, or E being a large set, so most locations are erased. Uh, the QMA uh, advice state uh, for this problem is just the um, quantum advice state uh, Z of F for the uh, relation R of F. And the algorithm is simple. You sample a uniform X, um, use um, the advice state Z of F to find um, U such that X of uh, X comma U is an R of F and you query it. Um, so just by the definition of this oracle, it's um, it's clear that if you query it and output the answer, uh, this will work. Uh, now we come to how to show a bounded adaptivity QCMA lower bound for this problem. So um, one thing we can notice is that uh, the the one instance oracle for the problem is a verification oracle for the Yamakawa Chantry problem. Um, so by a verification oracle, I mean, um, uh, you query the oracle at x comma u and it outputs one. If x comma u is an R of f and it outputs zero otherwise. Uh, so if the Yamakawa Jandri problem with a verification oracle for R of f and classical advice is hard, then um, we, I mean, the, uh, the Yamakawa Jandri problem being hard for with a quantum verification oracle and classical advice is a necessary condition um, 
in order for us to show the QMA process QCMA preparation. Um, so let's try to see how we can show that the Yamakawa Janri problem is hard with a verification, quantum verification oracle and classical advice. So first of all, we will notice that um, give, uh, giving classical advice is kind of like um, giving a partial assignment on the function f. Um, this is not true a priori, but uh, we can use a result by Goose Pitasi Watson, um, to uh, which decomposes a high en entropy distribution into something called tense distributions. Um, so the the uh, thing is that uh, if you are given a small partial assignment, a polynomial sized partial assignment on f, um, the distribution of f conditioned on that partial assignment uh, is a high entropy distribution. So you can uh, decompose it into these dense distributions. And dense distributions um, are kind of like uh, partial assignments in that they are fixed on some bits and sort of like uniform on the rest of the bits. And that's good enough for our purposes. Um, OK, given this uh, sort of partial assignment on f, what can now a verification oracle for r of f tell us? OK, first of all, you query this uh, verification oracle at uh, x comma u. And if you see that x comma u is uh, in R of f, then you know a partial assignment for f certifying the fact that uh, x comma u is in R of f. As I said earlier, the problem is kind of like TFNP. So if x comma u is in R of f, then there is a short partial, partial assignment certifying this. OK, now we consider some uh, pairs of inputs, outputs, xi, ui, and the partial assignments uh, satisfy, uh, certifying that these input output uh, pairs are in. RFF. So first of all, um, all these partial assignments, I said earlier that they're n-bit partial assignments. So all these partial assignments a priori are um, two to the minus n probability if I initially had um, a uniformly random function f. Now, um, instead what we start with because of the classical advice is um, a starting partial assignment on f. So suppose the starting partial assignment that I have is such that for each of these PIs that I considered, it fixes all but one uh, bit of every PI. So that means after the after I have the classical advice, then the each of the partial assignments becomes very likely. It uh, they become like probability half partial assignments. What can I uh, do with this? So okay. At the beginning of my algorithm, I start with a classical advice, which is like a pa partial assignment. And I consider all the um, input, output, and uh, partial assignment uh, pairs um, that Q makes very likely. Um, so in the first query step, I can query all of these um, partial assignments in superposition. By, by this, I mean I query the XI UI pairs corresponding to these partial assignments in superposition. And if I get one, um, these uh, basically I will know the extra bit of these partial assignments that were not fixed by my initial partial assignment. I will know this, this extra bit in superposition. Now in the next step, again, I can um, consider the new partial assignment that I have and consider more partial assignments that could post potentially become, become likely because of the new partial assignments that I have. I, like I, I can query them in superposition. So yeah, I mean, I can know lots of bits of the function in superposition um, uh, uh, in a few rounds potentially. So why is this bad? So because I know that the actual class quantum advice state that I need to solve this problem is superposition over all inputs uh, with the function value give uh, for that input. And um, if I can, uh, you know, depending on the structure of this graph that I've drawn, if I can traverse the graph in R rounds. I can also uh, prepare the state in R rounds. Uh, but fortunately, um, the Yamakawa Janri problem, uh, it's, um, it uses uh, list decodable code. I mean, a code with good list decodable deep properties. Um, using that fact, we can um, show that um, if we fix a small partial assignment of F, then the partial assignments that become likely uh, because, because of this partial assignment is like are not, not like too large that is uh, that imposes some structure on the on this graph basically which means at least in um, log n by log log n many rounds we cannot traverse this graph efficiently and therefore um, prepare this state 
and therefore uh, we cannot um, solve the problem in QCMA in only R many rounds. Okay, um, so the main open question left open by our work is obviously to do a full um, QMA versus QCMA separation without the restriction on the number of rounds. Um, so for this, we conjectured that there exists a, a relation uh, R of F that um, satisfies the, that you know is solvable with class uh, quantum advice, but um, is um, highly slippery. Oh, the, I forgot to mention that um, the property that the yamagawa Jandri problem uh, satisfies that this set of partial assignments PI that become likely when we fix a small partial assignment um, is small. Uh, we call this property slipperiness. So um, yeah, we conjectured that there exists a relation that is solvable by uh, quantum advice and which is highly slippery. So by highly slippery, I mean, if I fix a small partial assignment, does now partial other partial assignments that become likely because of this should be like kind of smaller than the uh, size of the initial partial assignment I fix. And yeah, if this is true, uh, this might also be true of the Yamagawa Chandri problem. We don't know, our analysis is not perfect. But if such a relation exists, we can do a full separation by our techniques. And yeah, okay, that's the end of my talk. Thanks. I have time some for some quick questions. Please go ahead. Maybe I'll start a basic one. Uh, what are some consequences for the separation between QCMA and QMA? Uh, uh, if you can show a full separation, that means uh, uh, relativizing technique can't show. <laughs> That QMA is equal to even in a um, like in a standard model, suppose these two classes are indeed uh, not equal, separated, then are there consequences in other areas? Mm. I guess if there are consequences in Hamiltonian complexity or something, it means not all. Uh, not all k-local Hamiltonian circle round states can be prepared by uh, an efficient circuit. I mean, there, there are probably other QMA complete problems for which it, there are interesting QMA complete problems for which there are consequences. Thanks. Other questions? I know people want to go for lunch, but we need to earn it. Please ask something. <laughs> well, if not, at least thank all speakers for this session. Um,